Good evening, good evening, Pastor Daniel Dagan here, Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church. It's my honor to join you again here Monday evening, April 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time here on the East Coast, and we want to welcome you into another Bible study. We've been doing this now about two and a half weeks online during this pandemic, and we pray that this has been a blessing to you. We pray that this is helping you, and I certainly appreciate your support, your kindness, your words, your prayers, the amen, and I just feel very committed, and my family and I feel very committed to continue this through the end of this pandemic, going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7 p.m., Friday, 1 p.m., and then Sunday, 11 a.m., and Sunday evening, 6 p.m., for the family prayer. And we started here a few Monday nights ago. We started with a study of salvation. What is the plan of salvation today? What is church age, yay, grace dispensation salvation? And we want to continue that study here tonight. I want to encourage you, as perhaps some are getting wearied with the pandemic and and being shut in and changes to routine and the flow of life. Don't get wearied with the things of God. Stay committed. Stay focused. Promote these broadcasts. Share them. Invite others to be part of it. I received tremendous feedback, different situations and things that God is doing. Time would not permit for me to go through all of them, but I just want to celebrate what God is doing through you, through the believers in this day and hour. And I appreciate your prayers so very much. Well, let us pray together as we get settled in with a Bible and the Holy Ghost, okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, mighty God, for your grace. Thank you, mighty God, for your mercy. I pray, God, that your touch would be upon us. Father, we need the anointing to prevail tonight. We need the anointing of the Spirit, God, to reveal and to instruct we need your spirit to lead and to guide people into all truth. I would pray, God, that we would be apt to teach all men with a gentle, peaceable, patient spirit. But yet plainly and simply, God, let us declare thy word. Work with us, O God, confirming thy word with signs and wonders following. Let the people hear the word tonight, God, and mix it with faith. And Father, we thank you, and we'll cease not to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Can I have an amen? Well, we want to again continue tonight as we have been teaching on Monday nights. Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we've been teaching on salvation. And then Tuesday night, 7 p.m., same Facebook page, we're teaching on God's nature, understanding God's incarnation, the name of Jesus, things of the sort. On Wednesday night, faith, 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 and more faith. Thursday night, we're teaching on the spirit world, satanic organization, and things of that sort in the spirit realm. Friday, 1 p.m., it's a different time. Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, we're teaching on end time prophecy, what happens after death, and those types of matters. Sunday, faith, 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 and more faith. So let us launch into it tonight. Just to review what we talked about last Monday night in our study. You remember, we've come through now in this study, Monday night, go back and watch the previous ones. We've come through what Jesus has said to Nicodemus, you recount with me, that you must be born of the water and of the Spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. We recount. What Jesus said in John 3.16, you must believe. Great emphasis upon faith. John 3.18, the name of Jesus. And then we came right through last week, the study of the Great Commission. We focused upon what was recorded in Mark 16 and Luke 24 and Acts 1. That's what we stopped at last week. Mark 16, Luke 24, 45 to 48, Acts 1, verse 2, down to verse 16. And the Great Commission, what is that? Well, it's essentially this. Jesus, after 
His crucifixion, yea, resurrection on the third day. He destroyed this body in three days. He said, I'll raise it up. He resurrected himself on the third day, yea, his temple on the third day. And then he was with them. We taught it last week. We showed you chapter and verse. He was with them for 40 days post-resurrection, leading up to the time of his ascension, ascending up to heaven, yea, in a glorified body having to leave the earth for the last time, the end of his 33 years of ministry. He comes back later, but it's different. That ends, his ascension ends, his 33 years on the earth, yea, three and a half years of public ministry. So we talked about that last time. In that place, the resurrected Savior gave the disciples, apostles, yea, this young New Testament church, those that would launch the book of Acts church, he gave them the plan of salvation. He gave them commission commands on what they're to preach and teach after he's gone. And he told them to go forth and, and preach. He that believeth and is baptized the same shall be saved. Mark 16, 16 to 20. He told them to go forth and that they would speak with new tongues in his name. We emphasize the importance of the name of Jesus multiple times last week in our scriptural study. And then in the Luke 24, 45 to 48, he told them that they would go forth now and teach repentance and remission of sins in his name. Repentance, faith, obedience, worship, dedication to God has been preached from the beginning of time. It will be preached to the end of time. Those truths are not tied to dispensations or time periods in scripture this subject of remission of sins a cleansing a water baptism that would bring about the remission of sins that was not preached until jesus the perfect lamb shed his blood upon the cross we talked about that last time he told them to go forth and preach repentance remission of sins luke 24 45 to 48 and then he told them first to go to jerusalem Pray for the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost. And then we finished last week in Acts 1. This is my opening review tonight. And they make it to their Acts chapter 1. And as Jesus is ascending to heaven, he's there and the apostles and disciples are gazing up. There's an angelic manifestation and the angels come and ask him, what are you looking at? And Jesus leaves from all of that. His closing comments as he's leaving is, you receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You will receive the promise not many days hence. Go to Jerusalem, yea, the upper room, and tarry or wait. So that's his closing comments. They have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the infilling of God's Spirit, yea, the one Spirit. So then he ascends up to heaven. Same place he leaves from Olivet's, the same place he's coming back to after the rapture of the church, after the seven years of tribulation, when he comes back at the second coming of the glorious appearing, Titus 2.13. He'll come back to the earth, he'll put his feet back on Olivet, the same place where he leaves from. And the scripture says that. So now we go into the new information tonight. Trust you have your Bible, have mine in front of me. I appreciate technology, we use it. But I like holding the Bible. Now, I like holding the Bible. Keep the preacher honest. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 4. Acts 2, 1 through 4. Again, we underscore, if you have a question, you want to send it to us, pastordagan at gmail.com. Appreciate all the good comments, the amens, as you're listening to the teaching. But send us questions, pastordagan at gmail.com. And what I do with those questions, I try to build them into my teaching as to not single anybody out. So it says in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, okay, to just set the stage. I believe it's right to say this scripturally. I'm certain it's right to say this scripturally. That um, you have to be very careful not to add to or take away from the word of God. Multiple accounts of that in scripture. Deuteronomy 4, 2, throughout the Old Testament, the Bible finishes up with very much the same language. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. You can't add to the Word of God. You can't take away from it. Isaiah sees it, 28, 10, and 11, line upon line, precept upon precept. Peter writes about it 
that the Bible is of no private interpretation. So with that being said, I think it's very dangerous to weight any one scripture as more significant or more relevant than another scripture. I think that puts you in a dangerous place. And I think, frankly, that's how a lot of the different denominations and churches came about. I've been asked, teaching hundreds, and I'm not making a boast, it's just a statement of fact, teaching hundreds and hundreds of home Bible studies through the years, one of the more common questions I've been asked in home Bible study settings with the unlearned or the unchurched, the sinner trying to come to God, is why is there so many churches? Why is there so many denominations if there's only one God, one heaven, one Bible? It's a great question. When you really dig it out historically, the origin of these churches, it is because of that reason, predominantly, that we have so many churches. That somebody skewed the focus too much in this area, baptism, too much in this area, the Sabbath. I'm not throwing stones. I'm just making a statement of fact. And they, they put too much emphasis upon one element or one passage or one verse. They almost, as a prophet of old would say in the Old Testament, they become the proverbial cake that's overcooked on one side, but it's, it's raw. Think of a pancake. It's raw or uncooked on the other side. It's very dangerous. That puts you in a position where you could, you could fall into error. And even in zeal, consider the Jews as we come into the church age even in Scripture. Zeal led them into error, religious zeal. So with that being said, we have to be careful about overstating the significance of a passage or overstating the significance of a verse in the Bible. Clearly, Calvary, death, burial, resurrection is head and shoulders. It's the intersection of Judaism and Christianity, the old covenant and the new. But we just have to be careful overstating a passage or a verse. With that being said, Acts 2 is the beginning of the church age. It's the beginning of the grace dispensation. I, I have read a lot of different scholars that have many different varied opinions on justification, on sanctification, on salvation, on the divinity of Christ, okay? On a lot of different things. And in the midst of the differences of opinion, I don't know that I have read ever or heard ever a respected scholar under the arena of Christendom that has a difference of opinion than what I just said about Acts 2, 1 through 4. That that is the beginning of the New Testament church. That is the beginning of the grace dispensation. I don't know that I've ever read one that may differ from my biblical teaching on different things, but never on that point. So when you get into Acts 2, 1 through 4, why is that so significant? That is the beginning of the church age. I know the pictures transpose, it's flipped, but you get the you get the feel. I've shared this before. This is Calvary, an artist's rendition of Calvary. What what they would say happened here just fifty days prior to Acts two, one through four, verse four. Fifty days prior to Acts two four. This is what happened. Jesus died upon the cross, rose again on the third day. From the time of his resurrection forward, fifty days. The day of Pentecost took place. Talked about that last time. Okay, why is Calvary and the day of Pentecost so closely associated and connected? What does Calvary have to do with the beginning of the New Testament church? Have you ever wondered that? What does what Jesus done at Calvary, his death, burial, resurrection, have to do with the beginning of the New Testament church? I've touched on this a little bit already. I'll just make another comment here to fit it into this explanation of Acts 2, 1 through 4. At Calvary, Jesus died when he dies, Matthew 27, 50 to 53. The veil of the temple is rent in twain. And, and that's more than a literal act that took place inside the gates of Jerusalem at that time, yea, at Herod's temple. It is that, but it's more than that. It's symbolic, a very significant representative of the passing away of the Old Testament ceremonial law, ceremonial law, I could say a lot there, but let's keep moving, passing away of the Old Testament ceremonial law and the transition period bringing us into the grace dispensation. No longer saved by the letter, now saved by the Spirit, saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Okay, so once he dies, that transition begins to happen. 
It's not completed until he rises a course. He's the first fruits. We've talked about that already on Monday night. And then it officially begins with the first group being filled with the Spirit, the promise of the Father. That officially begins the clock ticking of the grace dispensation. Officially begins the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. It begins in Acts 2, 1 through 4. So this is the official launch of the New Testament church. Okay, whenever you study in your Bible, um, the book of Acts, and many of you would know this, and, and you could articulate this yourself. Perhaps some may not. But when you study the New Testament, the book of Acts is that. The Acts of the Apostles. It records from Acts 2 to Acts 28. Those, t- those 27 chapters records records about 50 years of New Testament history. 45 to 50 years of New Testament history. And they literally record what the Bible says in Acts 17 and 6. They turned their world upside down for Jesus. The gospel was preached around the known world of that day. With great signs and wonders and thousands. Yea, numbers, numbers were saved and brought to Jesus, Jew and Gentile. Okay, that's recorded in the book of Acts. You want to study this is very significant. I get asked quite often, I, I make another reference to home Bible studies I've taught. And I get asked quite often, well, what about the thief and the cross? When we get into these very clear truths for the New Testament church, for you and I, for that person that you're talking to about salvation, they must, absolute essential, they must be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They must be filled with the Holy Ghost. And thereafter, they will have the sign of speaking in tongues. It's, it's a mandate biblically. We'll get deeper into this tonight. But I get asked often, what about the thief on the cross? He was not baptized. He never received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. It's a great question. And yes, he, the, the one thief went and was with Jesus in paradise that very day. Okay? Several points. Jesus is... God incarnate in flesh. He's a, alone the judge. He can forgive whoever. He can give whoever entrance into heaven. But beyond that, might I say in a, in a biblical examination perspective and standpoint, he was still under the law. The grace did not begin. The church age does not begin until Acts 2, verse 1 down to verse 4. So the requirements of water and spirit birth are not in place until you get to Acts 2, 1 through 4. Okay, now let's launch into this. In, in the weeks to come, I will, even after the pandemic, I will continue two teaching sessions online beyond our regular church schedule. I will continue teaching Thursday night at 7 online, of which I will deal with the most common questions I've been asked through the years, dealing with subjects such as justification, what about divorce, tithing, those types of matters. Things that I have been asked about all the time. And and then I will also, Friday 1 p.m. after the pandemic, continue teaching on prophecy. And yay, some of that will segue into the spirit world. So those will continue. And I'll deal with in the subject of justification, Romans 10 and 9. And also the thief on the cross and some of those things. Okay? So let's get into Acts 2, 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, put all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. It set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, catch it as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Several things. When you when you begin to study and read different things that scholars write about the Bible, this statement comes up sometimes, the doctrine of first mention, <clears throat> and how something is talked about, revealed, expounded, displayed in the Bible <clears throat> the first time, that's significant, that's telling, as you would think of in your mind, a first impression is a lasting impression. You know, the first time we see Satan, the subtility of the serpent in the garden, he manifests the three principal arenas or or pathways of temptation. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. 
And he manifests that with Eve. He manifests it later with the Christ. John writes about it in one of his epistles. So my point is, the doctrine of first mention is like a first impression. It's telling to what that experience, that person, that truth is going to be like in a lot of uh, respect going through the pages of the Bible. This Acts 2, 1 through 4, can you, can you just type it in right now? It's the first time, the first time somebody in the Bible has been filled with the Holy Ghost for the purpose of spiritual rebirth with the sign of tongues. First time in the Bible, somebody's been filled with the Holy Ghost for the purpose of spiritual rebirth with the sign of tongues. First time. So this illustration to me, it does cause me to shine perhaps a brighter light upon it and glean some of the details of this particular passage. I've had people say, well, what about Elizabeth and Zacharias, the parents of John the Baptist. God's Spirit is upon them and do them for the purpose of anointing them to give birth to and to lead the one that would ultimately be the forerunner to Christ. That's why God's Spirit was upon them. Mary was filled with God's Spirit for the purpose of conception, but Mary herself, go back, read Acts 1. Mary herself was present in the upper room because she had never been filled with the Spirit with the sign of tongues. She needed that experience. The apostles and disciples were not filled in John chapter 21 when Jesus speaks in John, I'm sorry, John 20 verse 22. Jesus prophesies to them and says to the apostles and disciples, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Clearly they were not filled with it there. It was a prophecy from Jesus to them pointing them to the day of Pentecost. Because in Acts 1, he tells them, you shall future tense, receive the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Talked about that last week. So this is the first time somebody is filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's kind of go through this scene. They're in the upper room. You can go back and study it. It's the same place where they was at for the Last Supper. It seemed to be, historically at least, a, a point in which they would gather, a place where they would gather in Jerusalem when they was there as a group in Jerusalem, this upper room. It was not just a random place they stopped at. They were there at the time of Pentecost, but it was a place where they would gather in a group setting. That's interesting. In a group setting from time to time when they were in Jerusalem, the disciples and apostles. And then there in that place, in the upper room, they're praying. Jesus had been with them post-resurrection for 40, for 40 days. Now they go to the upper room as Jesus commanded them, tarry, 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 or wait in the upper room until you receive the promise of the Father, which said you've heard of me, until you receive power from on high, until you receive the Holy Ghost. So they go there, they tarry, they wait, they sit, they pray, they tarry, they wait, they sit, they pray. Stop the tape, sidebar. Why did they have to tarry? Hmm, do we have to tarry now? I've been in services when I was a younger New convert came to the apostolic faith when I was 19 playing college football, University of Louisiana on a football scholarship. And, and, you know, there was comments made to me at that point that you had to tarry so long, pray so long, tarry, wait so long before you received the Holy Ghost. And it was an errant, incorrect understanding that was taken from language in Luke 24 and even some illustration in Acts 2. It's dead wrong, dead wrong. You do not have to tarry and wait for the Holy Ghost now. They had to wait the first time. All oh, that's very significant the first time. Acts 2, the first time because of the 50 days. Pentecost, there's a lot of symbolism there. Time won't permit for me to get into all of that. That's why they had to wait the first time. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, that's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for that to come for God to release His Spirit. It's tied to the Feast of Pentecost. It's a lot of teaching for another time. But they only had to wait the first time. Friend of mine, if you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, hear what I'm about to say to you. And you have repented. God forgive me. And you make a 180 about face turn. You have repented of your sins. And you have faith that when you ask God for the Holy Ghost, He will give you the Holy Ghost. You begin to open your mouth up, release your voice as an expression of your faith and your love and your worship for God, you begin to ask God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Just like it happened for them, it will happen for you. Hear the language. 
verse 3. They were in the upper room praying. The Spirit filled the house. The first thing, God's Spirit moves into the atmosphere where you're at. You will feel the manifest presence of God. God is omnipresent. If you don't understand what that means, it means He's everywhere at all times. Come join us tomorrow, 7 p.m. I'm teaching about God's nature. I address that. But God is omnipresent, fills all time and all space. But hunger, faith, worship causes God's omnipresent spirit to become his manifest presence. Tangible, discernible presence, manifest presence. They're praying in the upper room, expectation, faith. They're praying, asking for the promise, praying, seeking God, hungry for it. If you'll do that, praying, asking God for the Holy Ghost, hungry for it, seeking after God. He'll go from being just omnipresent, filling the atmosphere, to being manifested. You will feel the physical, if I can say it that way, the tangible, the quickening, the touch of God move from just being present in the house to sitting upon you. That's it. That's the manifest presence. You don't need somebody to tell you that's the Holy Ghost touching you. You'll know it's a Holy Ghost. I'm not against somebody. I do it myself. I'm not against someone telling another person that's praying for the Holy Ghost to fill them that's God touching you. I think it's good to affirm that. But you will know, friend, when the Holy Ghost sits upon you. You will know. You will feel it in your soul. You'll feel the peace of God. You'll feel the love of God sweep over you. No man could say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost, there's a dimension of the love of God that fills us. When we are filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll feel that. You may feel, you may feel some warmth like cloven tongues, like as a fire. I don't think that they had some type of experience where their skin temperature elevated and it was like fire. No, I'm on fire. No, I think the language is used cloven tongues like as a fire because God's spirit is equated tied to fire in scripture at times but then also more than that I think God wanted us to know that they felt they felt it in the body they felt it in the soul they felt it so he went from filling the house I'm not present to sitting upon them cloven tongues like as a fire manifest presence can feel it on the outside somebody Type in right now, Brother Gilbert, are you watching? Can you type in without, without? They can feel the Holy Ghost without. But then hear what happens in Acts 2, 4, and they were all filled. Somebody else type in filled. They were all filled, Acts 2, 4. This is the first time in your Bible. There's not a scholar, there's not an author that would disprove what I'm saying to you. And if they try to, give them my email, Okay. And I won't do it publicly. I'll privately talk to them, but they cannot disprove it. Acts 2, 4 is the first time somebody was ever filled with the Holy Ghost for the purpose, hear everything I'm saying, for the purpose of spiritual rebirth with the sign of tongues, with the sign of tongues. So Acts 2, 4. Now it goes from being without, here it is, to being within. There's a lot of precious people that have faith in God that are going to church and doing everything they know to do. They have faith and they repent. I don't care the name of the church. It doesn't matter. People are genuine. They have faith in God and they repent. But that's all they know to do. They have not been taught anymore. For whatever reason, they've not yet dug out these truths in the Bible. But they would do more. They would step into deeper depths of God's experience for them. They would embrace the totality of Acts 2 if somebody taught them. But but they do feel God's presence. They'll be in their services and wave their hand and somebody will come and an usher will tap them on the shoulder. Put your hand down. We don't do that here. They'll begin to feel, I've had them tell me by the countless numbers, they'll begin to have stammering lips and worship. They'll be singing a song, How Great Thou Art. They'll begin to say words, I love you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. God's drawn to that hunger. God's drawn to that sincerity. And then somebody will come to them and say, hey, can you settle that down? So they have felt the presence of God without cloven tongues like as a fire. They begin to shake and warm and cry and they don't know what to do. Stammering lips even, trembling, Isaiah 28, 10 and 11. But then the next thing that happens is then he fills them. If you've never received the Holy Ghost in your soul and spoken in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance. But 
you have felt God's Spirit sit upon you in a tangible way, like cloven tongues of fire, like with the preluding witness of stammering lips. That is a clear sign that He is ready to fill you with the Spirit. It's not up to Him now. It's up to you. You need to step into the next dimension. You need to yield your human spirit Notice what it says. Yield your human spirit. Allow the spirit to flow through you and release your voice and your tongue to the spirit. Notice what it says, Acts 2, 4. Doctrine of first mention. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Glacia, glacia, an unlearned language of a certain origin, but, but not necessarily traceable to linguistic experts. But they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hear me now. As the Spirit gave them utterance. I've had people come to me before with foolish YouTube videos and say a linguistic expert went to a Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled apostolic church with a recording device and they know they begin to record. Nobody knew it, but they begin to record people speaking in tongues. And they went back with the computer program and plugged in that recording and tried to determine if that was a language. And they concluded that it was Babel. So there's nothing to tongue speaking. Well, for every person that would say that, I can find a linguistic expert to give a report to the contrary of that. Okay? Beyond that, we are so blessed. I could say her name. She's probably watching right now. She watches most of these. Her and her husband go to our church, have been going to our church Baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. She would be ashamed if I said this online, but I'm going to say it. I won't say her name. She has a Ph.D. in linguistic studies from Georgetown University in Washington. She has multiple degrees beyond just her doctorates. She has multiple degrees and credentials. She speaks about 10 languages. Not just that she speaks 10 languages. She is certified to speak 10 languages and she is recognized globally globally as somebody that can translate into multiple languages that would hold up in the court of law under scrutiny she does it for many entities in the energy industry and natural gas industry and so forth okay i had bible studies with them for probably seven months um about one, six seven months about once a week okay and and she told me Without me baiting her, without me asking her, I ask her as a linguistic expert, not necessarily as an apostolic that can intricately explain all the chapters and verses, but as a linguistic expert, can you explain to me if tongues are a verifiable language? And she's been around tongue speaking enough to be able to answer that from a perspective of observation in church, as well as more importantly to me at that moment, was her professional credentials. She says they definitely, certainly are. You can pay attention to the tonation. You can pay attention to the repetition. You can pay attention to the rhythm, to the syllables, to the emphasis upon different elements of it. She said there is a certain pattern or a certain redundancy to them, as is the custom with languages, period. And, and I said, my goodness, this is exactly what I've been thinking, but I don't have the credentials in a secular sense to support it. Can you write it down? She did. And then I really tweaked and twisted her arm, said, can you under that put all your credentials? And she listed about two pages of degrees and qualifications. And she's Holy Ghost filled tongue talker baptized in Jesus' name. Okay? And then in a lesson after that, that I heard Lean Stone King teaching, he was talking about when he was in Bible college and they came to the church he was attending. And as they came to the church he was attending, they had done very much that type of study. And he had brought out some of the same points that this woman in our church had brought out that has a PhD in linguistic studies. So my point is Acts 2 verse 4, that when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit goes from without, sitting upon you in the form of cloven tongues like as a fire, to filling your soul. And thereafter, it will flow out of you. Remember, this is the first time somebody's ever received the Holy Ghost, been born of the Spirit, Acts 2, 4, for the purpose of spiritual rebirth with the sign or the evidence of tongue speaking. Okay, 
Remember John 7, 38 and 39? Jesus said, The Holy Ghost was not yet given because He, Jesus, was not yet glorified. So He was glorified at Calvary. The death, yea, the resurrection. That's why the Holy Ghost could be given now. So they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. As the Spirit gave them the utterance. Outside this upper room that they were gathered in, there were some 17 different groups recognized by name. When you read Acts 2, 5, down to Acts 2, verse 11, there were 17 different groups recognized by name. By name. And it's thought that probably the apostles Peter probably spoke Greek or some derivative of the Greek language, maybe some Aramaic. And that's why these 17 groups, when they heard them speaking their languages, the diversity of their languages, they begin to ask the question, how do these Galileans that speak that dialect, yea, that language, how are they speaking our language? It is because the Spirit of God within inspired, yea, they released the Holy Ghost and it began to flow like a river. David sees it prophetically when he says, My cup is full and yea, it runneth over. They released the Holy Ghost and it began to flow like a river. And the tongues begin to come forth as a witness. As a witness. So I've had people say, I could say a whole lot here about tongue speaking. I'll get into a separate lesson uh, maybe a few weeks down the road, where I deal with the different manifestations of tongues in the Bible and when they are interpreted and when they are not. I will deal with that chapter and verse. People, the nominal preachers, some of them, not all, really come to wrong, errant conclusions when they study about the nine gifts of the Spirit, but specifically 1 Corinthians 14 two of the gifts of the Spirit, tongues and interpretation. And they try to lump, group together every manifestation of tongues as the same, as to say, every time somebody speaks in tongues, it has to be interpreted. That is simply wrong. That is simply wrong. When we, we're going right now, as we work through the book of Acts, some chapter and verse, I'll give it to you, you'll see many times people receive the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, Fulfilling what we've already studied previous Monday nights. Fulfilling, you must be born of the Spirit. Fulfilling that mandate from Jesus. Being born of the Spirit is to be filled with the Holy Ghost. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost thereafter, you will have the sign of tongues or you will speak with tongues. Okay, throughout the book of Acts, you see that happening many times. Filled with the Spirit, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. We'll go through it. And they speak with tongues. And it's not interpreted. It's not operating with tongues and interpretation communicating a message to a local congregation. That's not what it's for. This, the tongues come forth as a sign, or even if I could use the word evidence, that that person has been filled with the Spirit. That's the evidence or the sign they've been filled with the Spirit. First category of tongues speaking in the Bible. I'll, I'll deal with this in detail going forward. The second category of tongues speaking in the Bible, it's seen in multiple places. Romans chapter 8, 26, 27, prayer language or intercession. Paul also touches this in his writings to the Corinthian church, that you should pray with an understanding at your natural language. He's speaking to the Corinthians, which are filled with the Spirit. They speak in tongues. But he says to them, you should pray with an understanding. That is your natural language. But you also should pray in the Spirit. That's praying in the Holy Ghost. When you pray in the Spirit in your time of prayer, what is that? That's what Paul says in Romans 8, 26 and 27. The Spirit prays through you with intercession, groanings which cannot be uttered. Praying according to the mind of the Spirit. We don't really at times know what we should pray for as we ought. But we feel a burden to pray for that person. To pray for that circumstance. But we don't have in our cognitive mind a list of everything that's going on. 
But we are certain that we perceive, that we feel, that we discern that there's a need in John Smith's life. So we begin to pray. Well, since we don't have an understanding of what the need is, what do we do? As Holy Ghost filled believers, we do what the Corinthian saints were told to do. We pray in the Spirit until there is a release, until there's a lifting. I wish I could get some help right now. Until there's a release or until there's a lifting, can I get an amen? Until the peace of God settles upon us as a sign that God has used us as an intercessor to pray over that person in that need. So that your prayer language of tongues is not interpreted. It's not intended to be interpreted. It's not a message to the church. That's the second category of tongues speaking in the Bible, yea, in the church age writings. The third category is that amidst the nine gifts of the Spirit that you read about. I'll, I'll deal with this later in detail, but 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. The nine gifts of the Spirit, two of them, tongues and interpretation. This point has crippled churches that used to be powerhouse Holy Ghost filled churches. I could say denominations now. I'm not going to. That's not who I am. I don't like to throw stones and single folks out. That's not who I am. But I could say their names. Okay, you go back and study the North American roots and the the beginning picture of the history of some of these denominal groups. They were powerful, Holy Ghost filled, holy living, committed churches. Now, all of them did not have the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. But many of them experienced the depth of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and gifts of the Spirit, were committed, holy living, all of that. And now they're just, it's, a, it's a dead denomination. And I'm not throwing stones. I hadn't said any names. Okay, they have misinterpreted 1 Corinthians 14 to the point that they have all but stomped out any movement of God's Spirit at all. 1 Corinthians 14 deals with one of the three categories of tongue speaking in the Bible. It's only one. And when the Spirit moves upon somebody in a group, a small group, congregation, whatever, and there's a message that's given in the Spirit, they speak in tongues. It's a heavy anointing. It's louder. It's a witness given to the elders, to the authorities of the church. God speaking. The congregation gives a witness to it. It's a hush that comes upon the congregation. Then that is interpreted in a language that is common to that congregation, be it Spanish, Italian, French, English, whatever the natural spoken language is for the majority of that congregation. The orderly way for that to happen is the message that came in the spirit tongues now should be interpreted in a language that the congregation, the majority of people speak naturally so they can understand what God says. That's the three categories of tongues speaking in the Bible. When you receive the Holy Ghost, God gives you tongues as evidence is never interpreted, never interpreted. You do not see that in the book of Acts 2, 8, 10, 19. When you have the Holy Ghost already, you should have a prayer language of tongues for the purpose of renewing, for the purpose of intercession. For the purpose of you being renewed, for the purpose of intercession, never interpreted. You will not find that it's interpreted in the Bible. And the third category is when there's a message given by God's Spirit through the gifts of the Spirit, tongues come forth. It's definitive. It's unique. It's different. It feels different. It's a heavy anointing. It arrests the awareness of the congregation. It's done the right way. The authority, the elder, the prophet judges it. It's done the right way. Behind it, it is interpreted. That's the only time it's interpreted in that category. We move on. Um, so in Acts 2, going back, these 17 different groups are confused, they're confounded, and clearly... Um, what they heard, they recognized as their languages, and they knew that the people in the upper room did not know those languages naturally. This was a dialect that the Galileans did not speak. That's why they were surprised. I've heard people say, well, this was a miracle. God gave them the ability to speak a foreign language to communicate the gospel. The text proves that that is dead wrong. You don't even have to know the Greek language, friend. The text shows that, that is wrong. That conclusion is wrong. Because when the people outside the upper room heard these languages, it did not, did not 
bring revelation, clarity, settling, understanding to them. To the contrary, to the contrary, it brought about people being confounded, confused. Some mocked. Some thought they were drunk. So if God miraculously gave them the ability to speak a foreign language to communicate the gospel, like some first century version of Rosetta Stone, it didn't work. Well, clearly that's not what God done. They were speaking in languages. Glossia speaks of an uncertain language. They were speaking as the Spirit gave them inspiration. It's a sign. It's an evidence that they have been filled with the Spirit. Because when the questions arise without what meaneth this, what meaneth this, does Peter go back to speaking in tongues? If the tongues is to communicate the gospel, the people that need to understand it, I wonder when Peter now steps forward. Remember, Peter standing up with the 11. Peter standing up with the 11, verse 14. Peter, the spokesman of the church. Peter, the one that's been given the keys of the kingdom. Upon this rock, Petros, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the ecclesia. That guy, Peter, that leads the New Testament revival in part. When he's confronted and he has the other foundational apostles by his side. And yea, the about 120 group is with him. And there's 3,000 in front of him. At least that's about to receive the Holy Ghost and be baptized. When he's confronted with those people that are confused, that are mocking, that are confounding, that ask the question, what meaneth this? If the tongues were some miraculous foreign language that they can now speak and wonder why he didn't go back to speaking them. Because that's not what it was at all. Peter continued to speak in his natural dialect. And what he says is, this is that. Joel 2.28. Joel 2.28. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Here it is. Remember I said a moment ago, Acts 2.4 is where the times of the Gentiles begins. Remember I said this is where the church age, yea, grace dispensation or time period begins. Well, when asked the question, what mean at this Peter standing with the 11, all of them in perfect agreement, stand up in unity. And Peter says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, said, God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So in answer to their question about how are they speaking a language, these tongues, what mean it, these tongues? Peter says, this is a sign. This is what Joel prophesied about. This is God's proof that he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Yea, different nationalities, kindreds, and tongues. This is that. This is the beginning of the church age. And Peter continues to preach on down through Acts 2. Can you go with me? We're hastening along now. Peter's message continues. And he's expounding about Christ being the Messiah. And there's a lot of preaching here. We come down to verse 36. It was the Romans' action that put Christ upon the cross. And it was the Jews' inaction that put Christ upon the cross, if I can say it that way. It was the Romans' action that put Christ upon the cross. And it was the Jews' inaction that put Christ upon the cross. And ultimately, it was Christ Himself, His love for us, that allowed them to put Him upon the cross. So we come now down to Acts 2, 36. Can you say amen if you're with me tonight? Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made the same Jesus whom you, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Kuros in the Greek, which is tied directly to Jehovah. Lord comes from Kuros, or yea, Jehovah, and Christ is the anointed one. Yea, the anointed flesh or vehicle that he was manifested in over those 33 years. So Peter, a Jew, howbeit unlearned, is preaching to other Jews that have gathered from all over the world, Jews from every nation under God, Acts 2.5, here for this great celebration of the Feast of Pentecost. And as he's preaching to them, he says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that that one God that you're worshiping, Yeshua, Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, now He's among us. That one you just crucified, that was Him robed in flesh. God in flesh reconciling the world to Himself. Tuesday night, 7 p.m., I'm teaching on the Godhead. 
If you would like to learn more about God's nature, the incarnation, God's divinity, and we'll also get into refuting the presentation that some take of the triune Godhead. And in the midst of these lessons, we will deal with pointedly Matthew 28, 19 and other passages that seem to bring some question to some people's mind. So, but now Peter continues preaching. Verse 37, now when they heard this, this is a crowd that was outside the upper room that that was gathered, some 17 groups mentioned by name in Scripture, some 3,000 that respond to Peter's preaching. It's been estimated by some scholars that the group that was present uh, in Jerusalem at this time probably tops out of 50,000 people total because of this Jewish celebration, one of the three times a year they would come to celebrate in Jerusalem. And Peter's preaching. And he now preaches to this group outside the upper room like a hammer, like a hammer. He says, uh, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It felt conviction, felt prick. For the first time, probably, they felt like their Judaism was not enough, was not suffice enough to bring them back to standing in God's mercy. They felt undone. They were pricked, felt undone. That's what that means. Felt undone in their standing with God. And they're asking, Peter, a Jew, that's now been filled with the Holy Ghost, yea, a follower of Christ, disciple of Christ. What shall we do? Hear the language. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Can you type it in? Save. Save. S-A-V-E. So he's preaching about them being saved. They ask, after being pricked in the heart, having their eyes open that Christ is, is the Lord, yea, Yeshua among us in flesh, the God of the Old Testament in flesh. When they hear that, they're pricked in their heart. And they feel undone. And they ask, what must we do? Peter says, you need to repent. God, forgive me for my sins. Make a 180 turn about. You need to be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. We'll talk more about this in detail. But there it is. Remember way back when, two weeks ago, we talked about John 3, 5. You must be born of the water, is what Jesus said. That's the first time that's fulfilled during the church age. Be baptized how? How, how, however you want. I'll do it any way you want it. You want to be dipped? Okay, we'll dip you. You want me to sprinkle you? Okay, I'll sprinkle you. You just got your hair done? Okay, I'll just sprinkle some water on your shirt and just do whatever. You want to do it in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost? Whatever. You want to do it in the name of John Smith? Okay. You want to do it in the name of your church? Okay, you want to do it in the name of whatever. No, 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 no. He gives them a specific command. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul writes later, Ephesians 4, 5, there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. There's one way that Peter, Paul, the apostles threw out. From Acts 2 forward, forward, there's one way that they were baptized. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Yea, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. You won't, you won't find one person baptized with the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the Bible. That verse, they, they misquote it, come to wrong conclusions, is found in Matthew 28, 19. I'll teach one lesson on that verse. And I'll go through that verse word by word and we'll explain it. But if you're literally to obey that, let me just give you a preview. If they were to literally obey Matthew 28, 19. First of all, in Matthew 28, when that's recorded, go back and read it. Keep the preacher honest. When you read that, there's not one person that's literally baptized during Matthew 28. It's not a baptismal service. It's not like somebody has 
papyrus paper on the side recording what's taking place. Okay, he just, ba- no, nobody's baptized in Matthew 28. It's the site of the Great Commission. It's where the resurrected Savior talked about this a little bit last week. This is where the resurrected Savior gives them a command. Go preach all nations. Go, go ye therefore into all the world, preach unto all nations, baptizing them in the name, name single of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they do. They go forth. They baptize in that singular one name, the name of Jesus Christ. That covers the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We'll talk about that in detail going forward. If they were literally to repeat those words or repeat that statement or fulfill that statement literally as he said it, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, guess how many times Peter baptized somebody with the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? That's how many. Guess how many times Paul baptized somebody with the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? That's how many. Guess how many times any, any of the apostles, any of the disciples from Acts to the beginning of the church until the end of the Bible, baptized with the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's how many times. If you have been baptized, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you have not fulfilled the biblical mandate. The name of Jesus must be pronounced over you in baptism as you are baptized. And they were dipped in water, immersed. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo. It means to be dipped or immersed in the water. When you read about them, John the Baptist as a type leading forward, he took him down into the river and baptized him. Peter took the Ethiopian eunuch down into the water where there was much water. They were dipped or immersed into the water. Sprinkling is not New Testament baptism. It's sprinkling. It's not New Testament baptism. Okay, that started in the dark ages. I could say the church that started that, it was because they was having infants that was dying in baptism. So they started sprinkling. It's a false doctrine. It's not biblical baptism. First of all, children, until they reach the age of accountability, they're not even at a place of being judged yet because they're not at an age of accountability. It's a doctrine for another day. So going back to, can you go with me? Acts 2, Acts 2, verse 40. And Peter's preaching, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promises unto you, your children, and as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then he continued preaching with other words. He testified, exhorted them, saying, save yourself, save yourself. So this is not just an extra blessing. This is the message of salvation that was preached to people that felt undone, pricked, and convicted in their heart when they came to the realization that Jesus was Messiah. Jesus was Messiah. And and he preached to them. And, and then it says in the end of verse 41, And they were gladly received the word and were baptized the same day. And they were added to the church. 3,000 souls, 3,000 souls. So it's a great picture there. Let me just make this comment here. Um, I've been asked before and challenged by people. Again, most respectable scholars in Christianity that I have read, and I've read a number of them, okay? And I've heard a lot of them that have different persuasions and I do on different things, but most of them agree that you must be filled with the Spirit. And many of them would disagree and have different views on tongue speaking. But you cannot get around Romans 8. Any man having not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The same Spirit that quickened Christ will be the same Spirit that quickens or resurrects you. Respected Bible people affirm that you have to have the Spirit. Okay, The question comes up, do you have to speak in tongues? Okay, the Bible teaches you must be born of the Spirit. It doesn't say you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. You won't find the verse that says you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. But, hear everything I'm saying. When people were filled with the Holy Ghost, and multiple witnesses throughout your Bible, multiple witnesses, Acts 2, 4, Acts 8, we'll get there next week, 24, 28, um, Acts 10, 44 to 48. Acts 19, 1 through 7. Other places, Paul speaking of his own experience and otherwise. Multiple witnesses, not one, not two, multiple witnesses where it says that when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they had the sign of tongues. Friend, when I'm talking about my soul, salvation laying in the balance, my family, 
people that I'm honored to pastor looking to me for spiritual direction. I want to make sure that I am sure and I have multiple biblical references to calibrate what I am saying, to affirm what I am saying. Okay, I've had people challenge me before, come to Acts 2.30 and say, "Mm, why didn't it say right there they spoke in tongues? They didn't, it doesn't say there they spoke in tongues. Well, when you study that in scripture, when a Jew establishes a truth about God, when they in the New Testament church establish a truth about God, spoke in tongues, when that's recorded in the holy text, one place, two places, three or four, why would it be recorded in multiple places? We have multiple witnesses. But to say because it's not recorded every single instance, that it's not a sound doctrine, I think that is very dangerous. There's some other things that's not recorded in every single instance. It's not recorded in every mention of Jesus coming that that he was God manifest in flesh. But it is recorded in multiple places that he was God manifest in flesh. You understand? So when you put together a compilation of all the scriptures, then we see the complete doctrine. Just because there may be one or two illustrations where it does not literally say chapter and verse, they spoke in tongues. We have enough literal examples where it says they spoke in tongues to establish that as a doctrine. Multiple, multiple witnesses. Does that does that make sense to you? So I just want to point that out. And I just want to maybe land it here. It's just after 8 p.m. on the East Coast and, and time just flies by. I want to give you a preview of what we're going to get into next week. Acts chapter 10. It is a story of Cornelius. Cornelius had faith in God before he ever got the Holy Ghost and got baptized in Jesus' name. He had faith in God. He was a man that was devout, which would mean pious in our language, noble, godly, I guess would be right. And he was a man that prayed, that seen vision of angels, built a memorial in heaven through his prayer life and his devotions, if you will. But there was still a need for him to experience, you must be born of the water, you must be born of the Spirit. There was still a need for him to be water baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there was a need for him to be filled with the Holy Ghost, yea, with the sign of tongues. You read that. Go, go ahead, go ahead of me and study Acts chapter ten, and you'll see that. My question for some is this, and I've had this come up many times in home Bible study settings. They they go to people go to John three sixteen, just believe. They go to Romans ten nine, just confess. Justification just simply by faith. Well, the problem with that is when you get into James 2, it tells you clearly justification is not just by faith. It uses the word justification. It's faith in works. So you can't just take some writings from Romans 3, chapter 3 to chapter 5, and say it's just by faith. You can't just take Romans 10 and 9 just by faith, just by faith, just by faith. You have to put it all together. Faith without works is dead. He that believeth and is baptized the same shall be saved. So you have to take all the Bible together. Now you have to take all the Bible together. So Cornelius was a man with faith. He prayed. He believed. He gave alms. He had visions. He seen angels. But God had more for him. Why wouldn't you want all that God has for you? Why wouldn't you want to experience water baptism if Jesus himself said you must? He didn't say as a, well, it's an extra blessing. It can help you become, you know, maybe more sensitive to my. No, he said you must. Be born of the water and of the Spirit, John 3, 5. So we'll get into Cornelius next Monday night, 7 p.m. I want to remind you, here's our finish. Tuesday night, 7 p.m., same Facebook page. I'll be teaching on God's nature and understanding His incarnation, the mighty God in Christ, the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Christ, the name of Jesus, three bear record in heaven, these three are one. We're getting into all that right now. Wednesday, preaching on faith. Thursday, teaching on satanic organization in Scripture and understanding, might I say, the kindred spirits of Satan and how when you entertain one thing, that one thing 
is a segue into something else. The spirits seven times worse than before. It's never just one area people are bound in. It may start in one area, but it always spills over. And before you know, doubt goes into depression. Depression goes into suicide. Suicide goes into all these other things. Thoughts of suicide goes into all these other things. Self-hurt, lashing out to others, hurting others. So it's, it's, a, it's a kindredness in the demonic, satanic realm. We're dealing with that on Thursday, 7 p.m. And then Friday, 1 p.m., what I call Prophecy Live. It's probably been the most responded to teaching I've done since the pandemic. Every week it typically is the most watched. And um, and share that. People's interested in prophecy right now. Right now I'm dealing with what happens when you die. Yea, a believer saint and an unbeliever, a sinner, that person has never come to Jesus. We're dealing with that right now. We're in the heart of that on Friday at 1. Um, let's pray together. Please reach out to me if I could be of any service. Pastor Dagan at gmail.com. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for people that love you. Take time out, God, to study the word. If it's live, if it's sometime later, help them to go back and really dig into this teaching. Dig into the word of the Lord. Help us to be a blessing to them. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we humbly pray. God bless you. And let me just say in closing, this is on a church's Facebook page. I'm here first preaching and teaching to the saints. People look to me for leadership as a pastor. Second, reaching out to all backsliders everywhere and the unsaved everywhere. If you're not locally in Southwest Florida, email me and I'll do my best to minister to you. If you need to be baptized, try to get you connected to a church. You need a pastor you can look to locally for leadership. And then if you attend another apostolic church preaching the whole counsel of God, then let me just affirm everything your pastor's saying. And if I say something different, please stay submitted to your pastor's teaching. And if you have a question for me and you go to a good apostolic church, whole counsel of God church, then just copy your pastor on before you email me. I like to stand with pastors. I love pastors. God bless you for you. Have a great night, okay?